Have you ever told ghost stories? Creepy, scary, keep you up at night, full of fear stories? Why? But have you ever told ghost stories? Stories of strength, goodness, help you sleep stories, help you live stories. Stories that don't give up the ghost, but bring the Holy Ghost. Stories of the power and magnitude of God and the Holy Ghost. Stories that bring heaven down. Stories that change the atmosphere. Holy Ghost Stories. Come on, Open Door Church. Let's give Jesus a big praise in the house. Hello, my friends, and everybody that's watching all over the planet Earth, man. We call you guys blessed in Jesus' name, everybody that came in today on a rainy day. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus, for the rain. Just go ahead and say it. Yeah, I promise you, that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Guys, I'm starting a brand new sermon series today, as you've heard, and it's called Ghost Stories. Everybody go, ooh, oh, yeah. One of the things I want to do is I want to make fun of fear today. I want to say to hell with Halloween. Is it okay if I say that in church? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's even legal in church, but I do want to say that. And I'm not mad over anything, culture, anything like that. I, I love all that. I'm not judgmental. I'm not religious about all of that. But there are some things that I'm not going to open up my mind and my heart and my family to. I'm like, I'm just not going to, I'm sorry, I got enough hell in my life. I don't need to just open up the door and say, please, hell, come right in. Thank you very much. And so today, guys, we're going to be addressing some really cool principles on how this works. Uh, And if you don't hear this out of the Word of God, you're not going to hear it anywhere else. So let's talk about Texas just a little bit. I love uh, geography. I love to travel. I love roads. I love towns. I love to map stuff out. And if you travel from here to Glen Rose, Texas, which is where I live at, you're most likely going to have to take Highway 67. And I take, I'm on Highway 67 all the time. My son-in-law wrote a really cool song. The Lord speaks from heaven on Highway 67. I don't know if I sing that all the time. (laughs) That's what I do. And if you'd go down 67 today, and if y'all go down to Big Time Glen Rose, Texas, and if you do not get your windshield busted out by one of hundreds of rock trucks traveling through there, we've lived out there since 2016. Leanna's been through five windshields. Oh, yes. Well, if you don't get your windshield busted out, it should be an enjoyable ride. And if you keep on going past my hometown and you decide to keep on going, just say, I want to stay on Highway 67. Well, then you just go to Steamville and you hang left. And about 10 hours later, you will hit the Mexican border. Highway 67 goes all the way to Presidio, Texas. And we used to cross over in Presidio, and it was another six hours from Presidio to one of the first orphanages we ever had down in the Copper Canyon. And so we used to drive across the Chihuahuan Desert and we'd, well, we'd go down, we'd go down to uh, Big Bend National Park, we'd cross over right there in Presidio, and then we would keep on booking. So I know Presidio, Texas very well. Now I wanna tell you that if you're standing in Presidio, Texas, and you're, and you're facing south, and you turn around and you face north, and you're looking at Highway 67 like, gee whiz, I wonder how far this road goes. This road, Highway 67, goes all the way from Presidio, Texas, past Davenport, Iowa. It is literally 1,560 miles long. Did you guys know that? It's a heck of a highway. It's something else. And you know what's right past Daven- uh, Davenport, Iowa? Winterset, Iowa, where John Wayne was born on May the 26th of 1907. <laughs> In your face, awesome. So it begins at Presidio, Texas, and it ends at John Wayne's house. That is an awesome highway. (laughs) Now, if you go back south again, and if you're heading down south, and if you're going to go down to Presidio, Texas, run into the Mexican border, if you go down to Big Bend National Park, you might as well stop at a town called Marfa. Now, I love Marfa, Texas. Now, it's a bunch of hippies and beatniks have been taking it over of late. But with that said, I've always loved Marfa. I've always, I've always thought that uh, Marfa is just such a cool town. It's where the movie Giant was filmed at. It's where Riata comes from, the Riata Ranch. And there's just such cool ranches down there and some really neat things. But if you're there, 
you might as well stop and look at the famous Marfa ghost lights. Now, if you're going to ask me, Pastor Troy, have you ever seen the Marfa ghost lights? I'm going to tell you, of course I've seen the Marfa ghost lights. I'm a Texan. I've seen them many times. Been out there over and over and over again. I started going out there when I was a little boy and and been out there camping all over that kind of stuff and, and, and seen them all kinds of stuff. And you know what? Just located about nine miles east of Alpine, uh, nine miles east of Marfa, going towards Alpine, Texas on Highway 90, they actually have the official Marfa Lights viewing area on the side. And as you look across the, Mar- as you look across the Mitchell Flat between Paisano Pass and Cathedral Mountain, after the sun goes down, man, you can get to looking out there and there's just these weird glowy lights that just start showing up out there. Is there anybody in here that's ever seen the Marfa lights? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. The rest of you guys are looking at me like I've been out squatch hunting. <laughs> it's legit. There are lights out there in that field. I've seen them. Everybody, you can go out there and you can see them. Now, most people would actually argue that, um, well, you know, <laughs> If, if, if you're not looking over to the left at Pazano Pass, and if you're looking over to the right at Cathedral Mountain and all that, which by the way, Pazano Pass is really cool. One of the reasons why Pazano Pass is so cool is because Leander Milliken, the great West Texas circuit, circuit riding preacher, was my grandfather's grandfather. I want to show you a picture of him. That's him. That's him. He's the second one on the left right there. Isn't he cool? Yeah, so that old famous, the world famous uh, circuit riding preacher out there, my grandpa's name was Alan Milliken, and that's Leander Milliken, his grandfather. So that's my, that's my great grandpappy right there, my great great grandpappy. That's him. He's a circuit riding preacher. Uh, there at the Saul Ross University, they, have a, they actually have a, a museum uh, of the Big Ben, and they have his Bible in it. And, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to steal, but. I've harbored some things in my heart throughout the years. I actually went there and was looking at it one time, and I told them, I said, you know, man, I, I wouldn't steal anything from anybody, but I would steal this Bible. And they're like, why would you steal a Bible? I'm like, because I'm a direct descendant of this man, and, and I just love him. And they're like, really? And I said, yeah. And they're like, tell me how that works. So I started telling them. So they're like, so you're a pastor of a church, and you are like the great-great-grandson of Leander Milliken? I said, yes, sir, I am. So they took a picture of me, holding his Bible. So if you're ever in the museum, look for me, because I'm in there. It's true. <laughs> Man, I just think that's so cool. I just think, that's, I think that is so cool. Well, let's get back to the Dagon Marfa lights. Most people, according to some experts, the likeliest explanation of those lights that you see across the Mitchell Flat out there is... Um, some kind of variance, it's like a mirage that happens because it's typically a 40 to 50 degree difference between 12 o'clock noon and 12 o'clock midnight. And it creates a kind of a weird mirage that happens out there. And a lot of people uh, suspect, and there's been some studies that show that when the highway, when, when 67 gets really busy, there tends to be more lights that's out there. So it's like some kind of a weird mirage that comes from the lights that are passing on Highway 67. And, you know, I, I, I would say, yeah, I would say that's probably legit. Most of those lights that everybody sees are some kind of a weird phenomenon that takes place just because you can see for 30 miles there and because the heat is so different and it causes a mirage and there's just some weird physics and some cool things that happen. And I agree with that. However, people have been reporting these lights since the 1830s. And it's like, since the 1830s, like, yeah. And there weren't no cars on Highway 67 in the 1830s. And then going all the way into the 1880s, Robert Reed Ellison, he was driving a bunch of cattle through Paisano Pass and wondering if, seeing all these lights, and he thought that they they were the campfires of Apache Indians. So the next day, he rounded up a whole bunch of settlers, and they went out there, no fires, nothing. No sign of any people out there. What in there like, what the heck are those lights? We all saw those lights and man, we couldn't figure it out. And then in 1885, somebody named Joe and Ann Humphreys, they reported seeing all these lights and saying, man, they kind of danced around and they, they did weird things and we'd never seen anything like it before. Other settlers begin to report stuff and even O.W. Williams, the grandfather of Clayton Williams, he first wrote of the mysterious lights in the 1880s himself and that's his property and his land out there. And so let me tell you what will happen if you go out there. 
If you go out to the Mitchell Flat and if you get on Highway 90 and there is actually a place built on the side of the road, a viewing place for you to sit and to look and they've got telescopes up there and all that so that you can look at it. And it's cool and it's a fun thing to do. If you do that, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get out there and you're going to see that and you're going to be like Bill Murray. You know, what the heck is that? What the heck is that? And then you're going to be telling people, I've seen them, I've seen them. And everybody's going to go, mm-hmm. But let me... And if that's the extent of it, then that's fine. But if you get out there and you get the heebie-jeebies and somebody starts talking to you about all kinds of terrible ghost stories and all kinds of stuff, let me tell you what's going to happen after that. You're going to open up a door into your life that invites the devil to be made manifest. Like, well, I just don't believe that. Well, then you go right ahead and look at all the hell that you want to, and you get, you get as scared of hell as you possibly can, and then let it be made manifest in your life, and you just call it living life normal. What's real is, whether it's the Marfa lights or anything, is, hey, man, we're going to go into this haunted house, and we're going to think about these really scary things. Because I want to tell you, I'm not scared of the Marfa lights. I've seen them a whole bunch of times. I'm like, man, I don't know what that is. That's, but it's awesome. I know the truth, and I'm not going to let myself come to a conclusion that is not kingdom-based. I have a biblical worldview, and just because I see something uh, I don't understand should not make me to question King Jesus. It should not make me to question the Word of God. It should not make me, if I see something I don't understand, I want to tell you guys, in dealing with, with, with children that are being sexually trafficked, I come across things all the time that I do not understand. I deal with things in my heart and in my spirit that I just go, whoa, I don't even know how to feel about this. I don't know any other thing to think except for I'm mad. I don't know anything to feel except for I'm heartbroken. I don't know anything. And then I'm just like, quit it. Stop it. I know that God is good. And none of this takes away from the goodness of the Lord. And I do believe that God loves me, even though I have literally had murder in my heart for traffickers. I've had murder in my heart and I've had to repent of that and go, no, I don't want to be like this. I want God to be able to trust me with this. Here's the deal. Just because I'm aware of these things and I don't understand it should not cause me to question my king and my kingdom. I don't, I don't have to commit treason because there's something I don't understand. Are you guys tracking with me on this? Because this is really important, man, for people to understand this. Because, man, you're going to come across stuff that you're just not going to get. And you're going to come across spooky and weird stuff. And you're going to come across stuff that if you're not careful, you're going to walk away given that mess authority within your life. Like, well, what are you going to do if the light of a Marfa light shows up? I'll use it to read my Bible. <laughs> like, Thank you, Marfa light. I, well, what are you going to do if it attacks you somehow? I'll bring a ball bat and I'll hit it out of the park. Sounds like some good shotgun shooting to me. Right? It's like, just quit it. Quit the scary nonsense that comes with this stuff because it opens up a door for hell within your life. See, guys, the devil is an opportunist. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for an opportunity. He's like, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, right here, here's one, here's one. Come on, keep, keep thinking that, keep thinking that, keep thinking that. Oh, there you go, here we 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 go. This is awesome. I want to just say it. I, I come across scary things all the time, and I come across, you know, man, I was out at Redemption Ranch uh, the past couple of days and just got in last night, and at 11 o'clock at night, I heard all these pigs. So I thought, man, I'm going to go out there. And I was by myself. And I'm going to go out there. And I'm going to go blast some pigs in the middle of the night. And it'll be fun in a Polaris chasing them. And I love, I love like driving with my left hand and shooting with my right hand. And so I got out there and I chased these pigs and they ran off the property and I didn't get any of them. And, and I was just in this pitch dark in the middle of all these trees. And I'm talking about dark, 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 dark. I didn't have my phone on me or anything. And I was just sitting there. I thought, you know what? I'm a grown man to be out here all by myself. (laughs) And I was like, I'm just going to turn off the lights and turn this thing off and just sit here in the peace of the Lord. And I sit there in the pitch dark 
And I'm talking about guys, y'all, it was dark. And I, I'm out in the boonies. And then I heard something snap and I went, nope. And I drove off. It's a true story. Well, I guess stupid. I guess, like, what am I thinking? It's just stupid. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing out here. I don't know who's out here. I don't even know what that was. Why would something be stepping out there? I just got through blasting the whole neighborhood. Why would, why didn't it run off? And then my head was like, it was something that ain't scared. Something that was watching you the whole time. And then you're like, uh, and then, you know, like, stop, stop, no, no. I'm just more like Don Knotts than I am John Wayne. That's all it is. It ain't anything else, and I'm not going to let myself think about anything else. And it's like, it's stupid to start sitting there thinking, what in the world, number one, it was something big. Number one, I don't know it was something big. It was just a twig broke. And in my mind, it weighed 400 pounds, and it had been there the whole time, and spit was coming out of its jaws while it was watching me in the dark. It's like, that's just stupid. Why would I even be thinking that? Like, but I didn't slow down driving back to the camp, tell you that. I was gone. I was like, this is craziness. So the devil is an opportunist, and he's looking for you to entertain things and step further and further and further and further away from the truth and further and further and further away from the presence of God so that he can deceive you and own you. And if you don't tell him no, and if you don't stop the madness, nobody else is going to do that for you. They're not going to. So it's actually no lawyer's trick. So it's, it's like lawyers do this all the time. It's a lawyer's dodge, and it works like this. Okay, this is true, and you agree with that, right? Uh-huh. And this is true, and you also agree with that, right? Uh-huh. Then this is true, and you have to agree with that. And you go, uh-huh, and he's got you. And it's, it's something that the devil does over and over and over again. It's like, okay, so it's like, um, God is love. Everybody say yes. yes. Love is blind. Then Stevie Wonder is God. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Like, okay, he's cool, but he ain't the Lord. <laughs> it's like, okay, but that's what the devil does all the time. And, and then you'll be like, he'll say, Right? And you go, yeah, right? And then you see, what you're doing is you're having a conversation with a snake. You're doing the same exact thing that Eve did. Don't you agree with this? Well, yeah. And don't you agree with this? Yes. Then come to the, clu- then come to the conclusion that you can't trust God. Trust this. And are like, oh, no. Yeah, don't think that you're any better than Adam or Eve. Because we have bit into the same fruit over and over and over again. When I was a little boy, there's, there was, I lived in rural Johnson County, Texas, and this is how it worked when I was a kid. At about nine o'clock in the morning, after we ate, you went outside and you didn't come back in the house until sundown. And I know that sounds crazy to everybody now, but we'd be gone and me and my cousins and my neighbor friends that lived down the road, um, you know, we'd all get together and we'd play in the woods and we had forts and we'd throw rocks at each other and fun stuff, right? <laughs> Set things on fire. What could go wrong? But the deal is you had to be home by sundown and, and they weren't kidding when they said be home by sundown. So let me tell you how they made sure that we would all come. They told horrible stories about what happens when the sun goes down. And I learned the horrible tale of raw head and bloody bones. As a five-year-old child, I was horrified of raw head and bloody bones. And if you think I got a hick accent now, you should have heard me when I was five. Raw head and bloody bones out there, Paul. (laughs) Dang, Skippy, son, you better not be out there past dark. You better be in that house, boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be back in the house. I don't want to see no raw head and bloody bones. And they all got a hoot out of it, and they all thought, they all thought it was funny, and, and you know, they just, that's just old Texas folklore, and it's something, I was also scared of Grandma Moses. All we had, listen, we had a television, but all there was was Channel 5, Channel 4, Channel 8, and Channel 11. That was it. Anybody remember those days? Yeah. And it went all off at 10 o'clock at night. Signed off with the national anthem. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Man, they all need to turn off, actually, now. And so, man, I was out there one day, and, and I was having a good time, minding my own business, and my papa, he had taken a pig, and he had slaughtered the pig, and he put the head up on top of a fence, uh, on top of a fence post, and then he took uh, that pig to go be slaughtered, and him and, the not- uh, him and the neighbor slaughtered it. So papa wasn't there, and that pig head was on that post. And I'm five year old, do 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 And I walk, come I come through the woods, and I was like, "There's blood all over this place." And I looked up, and I seen raw head and bloody bones right there. I literally fell down on the ground when I made eye contact with raw head and bloody bones. I fell down on the ground and I couldn't get up. I was trying to get up, trying to get up, trying to get up. I couldn't get up, trying to get up, trying to get up. When I did get up, I ran into the fence, went all into the barbed wire, got through the fence, ran through the woods like a daggum pinball machine, gang, 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 bouncing off of every tree that was there. They could hear me screaming out in the woods. And so my mama comes running out there and I was running through the woods and mama was running out there and all the adults come because they could hear me screaming. And they come running out there, and I was like, ah, and I was totally freaked out, and I was hyperventilated, and I vapor locked, and I totally freaked out, and I was like, ah, 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 ah. And mom's like, what happened? What happened to you? What happened? Because I had blood all over me. I fell down in that blood. Oh, listen, no. I was covered in blood, like Carrie. Right? Big blood. And I'm like, good, googly. And they're like, what's going on? Oh my God, my God. And I had cut, I was all cut up and whatnot because of the barbed wire. Like, what happened to you? And I couldn't breathe. I was trying to breathe, trying to breathe, trying to, and my mama was like, Troy, calm down, baby. It's okay. It's okay. What happened? And I said, raw head and bloody bones. (laughs) And they were like, what? I said, mama, I've seen him. (laughs) <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I promise, I've seen him. And he's tall, tall, tall. <laughs> and, oh, he's bloody and he's horrible. And I've seen him. And I was like, you saw raw head and bloody bones. Like, yeah. Like, show me. And I'm like, uh-uh. I'm done. <laughs> I'm becoming a city boy now. I'm moving to downtown Dallas. I want nothing to do with your stupid woods anymore. <laughs> I'm done with Lily in Texas. I'm done. This is ridiculous. This place is dangerous. I totally freaked out. So he took me in the house. I'm just, I was hysterical. I was like totally freaked out. And Papa came. They called Papa, and Papa came running. Man, he comes. He got his pistol in his hand. He's going to kill somebody, and he wants to know who did what to me and what the heck's going on. And he said, raw head and bloody bones. like, where was you, son? Well, he was down there by the barn, and Papa said, Papa said, I, I know what he saw. And he said, what? He started laughing. And he just started busting out laughing. And he laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed until he peed in his pants. <laughs> I'm so not going to be able to use this on television. I'm glad you guys are enjoying this. I'm not going to tell this story in the second one. I'm not going to. I got a great word to preach, and I'm too caught up in raw head and bloody bones. But I saw my grandfather <laughs> pee in his pants, and he was only like, you know, 40-something years old, right? And so I'm like, oh my gosh. So I remember my mom yelling at my grandfather, quit telling him these ghost stories. Don't y'all ever tell him another ghost story. He is a little boy and he's got a wild imagination. He's not right anyway. (laughs) There's something wrong with that kid. And you can't tell him a story about raw head and bloody bones and not expect him to lose his mind. Look at him, look at him. I was just sitting there going. (laughs) (laughs) I remember my great grandfather laughing so hard. He's smoking his big old pipe, man. And he was laughing, laughing, laughing. He said, oh, hoss, he seen a pig head out there and he thought that was raw head and bloody bones. And they were like, did you hear him say he's tall? He's on the fence post. He's tall. 
He's tall. You know why he's all cut up? He ran through a barbed wire fence. He ran through a barbed wire fence. That's how scared that kid was. Oh, I was impervious to steal. <laughs> you know what that is? It, it actually opened the door. I'm just going to just tell you this. And, I, and again, I love my family and I'm not, I've done, I've done crazy kids with my kids and grandkids. I used to put on a ghillie suit and run around like Bigfoot and my kids spotted me. And I thought that was the funniest thing I ever saw in my life. But I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go to sleep after that. And it wasn't just that night. I'm talking about for years and years and years and years and years. I, I just, and then I started seeing stuff. And then I started hearing stuff. And then demonic stuff started happening to me. And it, because I was so deceived and so scared and so terrified, and I didn't have the skill set to think it was funny yet. I think it's hilarious now. But I didn't when I was five. <laughs> and little things just, any, I started thinking the worst case scenario of horror every time anything bad would happen. I remember when I was probably maybe six, it's like a year later, I went back in the woods and Papa had killed a deer and he had gutted it and it was hanging up, right? And you know, I saw its horns and in my little boy mind, after the trauma, of raw head and bloody bones, in my mind, it was a creature that stood upright that was all bloody and open and then was walking around like this with horns on his head. It was actually just hanging in the tree. And I started having nightmares of deer after me. And they walked on their hind legs when they would come into my room and their guts were open and they'd walk in and they're gonna get me with their horns, right? I don't know, I was like six years old. And it started something within my life that um, it took years and years and years for me to learn the word of God and learn how to have the presence of the Lord within my life. The Bible defines that kind of paranoia where you're just jumpy, you know, all the time. You're thinking worst case scenario, something's gonna get you. He defines that in Leviticus chapter 26, verse seven as a curse. And this is what he says, you shall flee when none pursues you. That you'll be scared something's after you all the time. Do you know that our, a lot of the entertainment that we watch today is all about, it's gonna get you. And I wanna tell you, do not entertain yourself with that. It will open a door to hell within your life. Like what was harmless when I was watching is just a TV show. Yeah, but it wasn't at three o'clock in the morning when you started getting choked by a demon. I can go on and on and on about that and go, okay, it's harmless, just harmless entertainment. It's just harmless this or whatever. You know, a lot of the anxiety and the fear and the paranoia that we suffer is self-inflicted because of the things that we allow into our lives. The Bible says, uh, whenever the word of God tells us, hey man, you need to be sober, you need to be vigilant. What is that, First, Pe uh, First Peter chapter five, verse eight? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil walks about as, that, that word there, sober, means to be serious, and vigilant means to be intentional. Like you need to be serious and you need to be intentional about what you let into your life because the devil's watching to see if you're gonna open a door. It doesn't say whosoever he will devour, it says who he may, who gives him permission. And it's kind of like chum in the water you're swimming in. And then being surprised when the jaws of hell shows up and gets you. Well, you can constantly chum the water because you're a knucklehead. I'm not, listen, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a diver and Leanna and I love to go scuba diving and I was in uh, Hawaii last year and I went, you know, I, I, I love to get in a cage. I like to get in a cage. I like to get underwater and I like to see the sharks and I just think it's cool. Now I want a cage around me, but but I want to tell you, when you get in that cage and you get down underneath the water and they start chumming that water, you question if this is a good idea. <laughs> it's like, I think I need to rethink my decision-making paradigm. <laughs> okay, well, just exactly like that, we chum the water of our own lives and we remove all kinds of peace because we choose to be entertained or we choose to engage in things in the culture that Jesus is not involved in. And it's just the fact, Jack, as the prophet Bill Murray once said. So 
The devil will, will bring you to these conclusions. He'll say, this is right, right? Yes, this is right, right? Okay, then this is right. And we will agree because we're so used to the first couple of steps. We've been groomed towards a horrible outcome. Well, anxiety keeps us from having mastery within our own lives. Philippians 4 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I want to talk to you about if you're determined, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be full of anxiety. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be full blown in the kingdom. I'm going to bring this before the king. A prayer is something you verbally say, a supplication is something you write out and send officially. Like, okay, so how do you do supplication before the Lord? You know, it's making your, it's making your request, it's official, which means you pray and decree the word of God. This is what the word of God declares. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. The enemy that comes against me one way shall flee before me seven different ways. This is the word of Almighty God. It's the word of King Jesus. This is the way that it is. I'm declaring that. And Father God, in the name of King Jesus, now that I have made my declaration and I've done this in your name, please release your angels for the performance of your word. And, and it's like, okay, it's like official. It's like me operating in the authority of something. So my prayer is like my relational part with God. My supplication is me operating in the authority of it. And then it says, with thanksgiving. So uh, in all this kind of stuff, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. It's hard to be full of all kinds of depression if you're full of all kinds of thankfulness. Isn't that good stuff? Hey, I want to tell you, man, if you're not thinking right, and I do this all the time, what? Not think right? I just go, Dad, gum it. I mean, I was, I was driving back from, uh, from Redemption Ranch. It's like three and a half hour. I had about an hour and a half conversation with somebody who wasn't in a car. I told him, but I thought about him too. I act like a grown man, tell you this right now. Y'all would have been so proud of me, except for it was all bogus. I started having strife coming back because of some knucklehead. And just like, whoa. And then I just went, I just wasted an hour and a half of my life thinking about something that does not matter. Like, well, I can't even have a right mind. Well, let me, let me pull over here to an all subs. Let me get me a burrito. And now let me write down some things here. What am I thankful for? I'm thankful that I'm in this really cool truck and that I'm driving from one really cool ranch to another really cool ranch. I'm thankful that I have a beautiful wife waiting for me. I'm thankful that my grandkids are going to be there whenever I get there. I'm thankful for the, and I just started, I, I mean, you literally, you, you can't bring prayer and supplication without Thanksgiving attached to it. I mean, you got you, you to gotta have a long list of things that you're thankful for and, and actually get into that and go, God, seriously, a lot better people than me have never had these things. People that really had their act together have never had these things. Thank you, God. What a privilege. Well, fear will also keep us from moving into our destinies. We know in Isaiah 41, it says, you who, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and I've called from the farthest regions. I want you to think about this. What has God, what has God taken you from? The farthest regions of things. It's like, have you forgot that I came and got you? You know, when I, when I meet that beautiful little girl in Mexico, that we just rescued uh, yesterday, last night. When I meet that 12 year old little girl that has known nothing but abuse, family tricked into the whole thing of, hey, you know that in America, all you gotta do is get across the border and man, they will fund you, fund you, fund you, fund you, fund you. Let us bring your kids over there. She's gonna have a lot better life, okay? Get them to the border and then get those children involved in the worst kind of pornography that you can possibly imagine. Nobody in the world willing to help her Nobody in the world willing to protect her. What is her crime? She's a little girl. That is her crime. It's just, just like, wow. Okay, well, she's out of that mess, and she's in the process now of being saved in every way that a little girl can be saved. And I can't wait to tell her. Can't wait to tell her. I, think, I just think it's so cool, man, that God saw you and pulled you out of that. 
man, you have so much favor with him. Man, he loves you. I don't know what it is about you, man, that he just thinks is so cool, but he does. He literally came after you and literally rescued you because he loves you. I cannot wait to tell that little girl that story. I just can't. Whenever we're looking at Isaiah chapter 41, he starts off with this. He says, hey, I'm talking to you to whom I am taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest reaches. It's a miracle you're here today. It's a miracle that you have the heart that you have. It is a miracle that you're not caught up in what so many of your friends and your families got caught up in. And you, for some time, was caught up in it. And look at what the Lord has done. A lot better people than us have not made it to where it is that we're at, and we should be thankful. Amen? He says, um, you're my servant. I've chosen you. Not cast you away. Fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed. Do not freak out, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Behold, all those who are, in, who are increased against you, well, they're going to be ashamed and disgraced. That is a good word to hang on to. You know, can I tell you what that means? It means this. God is saying, listen, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you, but you need to know this. I'm going to vindicate you. You don't think that's a big deal to me? It's a big deal to me. I'm going to bring vindication. And you're going to see it because you're one of mine and you don't mess with mine. Amen. And then it says this, they shall be as nothing and those who strive with you shall perish. Meaning it's just all going to ball up and blow away. That's what it means to perish. It just means to come down to nothing. It's all going to come down to nothing. It's going to perish. Man, I love that. So, in closing up here, I want to just tell you this, guys, that we need to be determined to be impressed with goodness instead of being impressed with evil. And go, I don't want to be impressed with evil. I don't want to be blown away with evil. You know, our flesh is naturally attracted and fascinated with evil. And a culture that embraces darkness resists the rule and the reign of King Jesus because that mess is not in his kingdom. You know, there's something about us that wants to be really impressed with bad. It's why I love it whenever Tony Montana says, say hello to my little friend. I'm like, yes! And he blasts something through his bedroom door at the people that are about to murder him. And I suspect it has something to do with our survival instincts or how we want to understand and the things that we want and, and the things we don't want to fear. And, and we want to be tough and we want to be awesome. So we will engage in things that are really dark and say, we can handle it. We can, we can handle it, whatever it is. Whatever it is, guys, that causes traffic in the northbound lane to slow down when there's a wreck in the southbound lane. <laughs> Whatever that is. It causes the ratings of the news media to skyrocket during disasters and the tabloid racks to go empty when a celebrity gets divorced. Or when a grandfather decides to become a female sex object. Well, what's even more amazing is that when we can't see enough impressive bad things for us to look at, we begin to invent new forms of bad that entertain us. I'm reading now from my book, Good Overcomes Evil. At first, we invent giant krakens that take down ships in uncharted waters. And then we invent monsters that invade whole cities. We upgrade from corporate into personal, and we invent human feeding vampires and werewolves. Then we begin to make their horror sensual, even erotic, and we turn these monsters into romantic attractions for us. That's how impressed we are with evil. That's what we do, and that's how we are, because we love to love bad. It's important, guys, that we learn to no longer love as the world loves. We have to hold tight to the, to the goodness of God instead of the evil of this world. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. And then verse 9 says, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. That's what the word of God says. You know, if you engage in scary things and you're a part of things and you're like, hey man, uh, and, and, and again, I'm not judging anybody. Up until 1986, when I got saved, I read every Stephen King book there was. And I'm telling you, I can still quote a bunch of those books. I can still tell you all the characters that's in it. I can tell you, I can tell you the plot lines. I can tell you all that kind of stuff, man. I'm telling you, and all those books are about that thick. 
And I read them and read them and read them and I made notebooks on them and wrote the characters dead. You know, how is, how is Stu Redman connected to Randall Flagg? I, see, I can pull out the characters' names. I haven't read The Stand since 1986. And I can still pull up all the characters' names I can, I can tell you right now. The Trash Can Man. I can go through all those kinds of things. And, and go through those things and go, wow. And, I, and things would get so scary. And I would just contemplate how horrible the situation actually was. And you kind of get good at contemplating horror. And I want to tell you, it works in direct contrast to how the Holy Spirit is trying to work, work within your life. And we don't need to be good at loving bad. We need to be good at loving good. And we need to make a big deal out of that because guys, you can, you can get into something that you, that you see and you don't understand it and it's scary and it brings confusion. Okay, scary confusion causes fear and dread. But the Spirit of the Lord brings you into wonder and awe. So the Holy Spirit doesn't, listen, you're not being ripped off by getting away from fear and dread. I promise you, you're not. You're being blessed because you get to get into wonder and awe. So what is wonder? It's like, I have no idea. It's a wonder. And if it's a wonder of wonders, it's a wow, W-O-W, wonder of wonders. That's, that's an acronym for the word wonder of wonders, wow is. Everybody say wow. wow. So it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's an enigma wrapped up inside of a mystery. Like, dang, man, I don't, have, I don't know what to think about that. I don't have any idea. And this brother coming here, man, I got five or six marbles in me where I was shot in a gang. Well, let's pray for you. Go to the doctor and they're gone. Bullets no longer in him. I've actually seen that happen. Like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. See, it's not a confusing fear. It's a wonder. And then you get into awe. Like, okay, it's, it's where we get the word awesome. It's where we're like, man, it's just so awesome. Like, oh, Wow. If you've ever seen my three keys to remaining passionate for, for King Jesus, one is personal involvement, the other one is supernatural encounter, and the third one is mapping out God's heart. Okay, that mapping out God's heart means this, I want to be consistently blown away with how good God is. And if I hear an entire story, and if there's nothing in there that shows me the goodness of God, I'm changing the channel. Like, well, you, you can't just do that. Sure I can. I'm telling you, you actually can change the channel. I know it seems impossible, but you can. If I'm watching a movie, and I don't care if there's bad guys in it. I don't, I don't even care if there's some rough stuff in it. I don't care if there's violence in it. The, Bible, the Bible's violent. What I care about is this. Is it hopeless? Because I ain't messing with it. If it's hopeless and if it's dark, I'm not gonna be entertained by that. I'm not gonna sit through two hours of me not being able to come to any other conclusion except for that stinks. Well, I got plenty, I got enough of that within my own life. I just gotta constantly dismiss, constantly dismiss. So why would I entertain myself with things like that? Why would I do that? Friends, I want to tell you that the Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, to set your mind upon these things. This is finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, stop. That word true. And there's eight things in Philippians 4, 8 that we're supposed to think about. But the first one is true. And we think about, you know, man, is that true? Meaning, is it not false? That's one layer of understanding. But the other part of that is this. Is it on target with the life that God has for you? Right? Man, I was, I was you know, testing my pistols the other day when I was out at uh, a Redemption Ranch and I kept missing a target, kept missing a target, kept missing a target. And I'm like, something wrong with this gun. <laughs> yeah, obviously something was wrong with the gun. And so I was, <laughs> I, I kept, and I was like, dad gum it. And I was like, I can't believe I'm not hitting this thing. Finally, I started hitting it and, start, uh, and I started figuring it out. And when you hit the target, when an arrow hits the bullseye, it's true. So hitting things on target has to do with truth. So here's the deal. Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, and I wanna just stop. The next one is whatsoever things are honest, and that means transparent and real. Okay? It's like, hey, is it transparent? Is it real? Can you, can you, is it, uh, listen, you need to have the supernatural gift of real. I have that gift. 
this first one right here where it says things are true. What's real is there are things that I will find myself engaged in that I go, this has nothing to do with the life that God has given me. And it's not true. I'm, I'm engaging now in something and I'm thinking about something that has nothing to do with what God is speaking to me about, with the promises that God has given me, with the goodness of God. It's none of those things, therefore it's not true. So why should I think about it? Well, you have the capacity, Troy, you know, sometimes, you know, you actually can be fairly smart. You ought to think about this thing, but what, if it's not true, I don't need to think about it. If it's not on target with who God has called me to be, why do I, you know, I don't want to spend 45 years of my life trying to figure out whatever happened to D.B. Cooper. Like, well, that's kind of interesting, don't you think? I think it's interesting that somebody will waste 45 years of their life trying to figure that out when they have a wife and they have kids and when they have a job and when they could go to the next level and they could have real estate and they could have money in the bank and they could go rescue somebody out of sexual trafficking. Actually, no, I don't think it's cool to spend 45 years of your life trying to find D.B. Cooper. The brother is dead and he's either in heaven or hell. That's where he's at. But what about the mystery? Okay. There's so many mysteries in Jesus and there's so much wonder and awe that you and I could get into and we just go, dude, I'm blown, oh, oh my gosh. I Really, this is, and it's on target with who God has called you to be. Friends, I would just wanna tell you this. This time of year, don't be sitting around telling ghost stories. Sit around and tell holy ghost stories. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. microphone I got to talk into. Man, I, I hope you guys enjoyed it because I'm never going to preach it again. I got so many good notes and so many good things and I went off for 30 minutes about raw head and bloody bones and I apologize. <laughs> you, would you guys stand up? Hallelujah.